I've been dreaming on in my head like I've seen it a life worth Okay, first of all, it seemed like a normal apartment. When we got inside, he turned off burglar alarms. I asked him why. First, it was a foul odor, okay? Tell and us about that. What kind of an odor? It was just like an odor. I didn't quite know what it was. You know, he told me a sewer pipe had broke and management would take care of it. Now, you're fully clothed. Yes. Okay, and you're sitting on a couch. Right. And he offers, he talks to you about uh, the disposing, and you weren't sure you were going to do it. Right. How much had you been offered to do the post? A hundred dollars. Okay. And when he get, brings you the beer, he brings you rum and coke? Yeah, he brings that. Yeah, he brings the, the beer first, and then he brings the rum and coke. Okay. When you start talking about the fish in the fish tank, do you bring that up or does he? Uh, he does. And what do you do when he does that? I turn, my, turn to the right like the fish tank is here. I'm turning all the way over here. You yeah. turn to your right to look at it? To look at the fish tank, right. And when that happens, what happens to you? Oh, all of a sudden, a handcuff and a knife is pulled on me. Yeah. Handcuff is placed on your body? Where? Uh, on my left wrist. And you see a knife? Yeah, the knife, yeah. Now, at that moment, what do you do? First, I feel fear. Then I ask him, what's going on? You know, this is not necessary, you know, to pull a knife on me. At that Are you moment. afraid? Do yes. you have any reason to know why he did that? None whatsoever. Did you have any idea at that time it was going to happen? No. Did that room have a TV set in it? Yes. Was there anything going on on the TV? Yeah, the Exorcist movies was playing at that time. There was an Exorcist movie on it. Yeah. you know which one of them? Uh, the name I'm not sure. I think it's three. I'm not sure which one. Yeah. So there was a movie. Did you know it to be part of television or VCR? Uh, VCR, normally that's not on regular television, so I thought it was VCR. You knew there was a movie show. Right. Did you see him put it on, or was it on? No. When we first got into the apartment, he went through the back, to the back bedroom. Maybe he put it on then, I'm not sure. Okay. And then what happened? You're both sitting on the bed? Yes. Are you still in handcuffs? Yes. Is he holding the handcuff? Right. Do you still have the knife? Right. Is it pointed at your side, as you've told us before? Right. You trying to be cool? Very much so. You're not, a, you're not fighting with them? No. What's your all. intention? What are you planning on doing? Getting away. I was contemplating on at a point, jumping out the window. Yep. I was basically talking with this person, trying to let him know I was his friend. Yeah. As you were sitting there on the bed, when he had you by the handcuff and a knife at your side, at that time, which would have been maybe 7 o'clock, Something like that. What impression was made upon your mind by the conduct, action, manner, expression, and conversation that you observed of Mr. Dahmer? His frame of mind is what you want to know, right? Okay, he acted. At times, he would go through, like, different changes with me, you know? One Tell minute, us about that. One minute, he's, like, nice. And then he was telling he didn't want people to leave him or abandon him. Things of this nature, you know? Yeah. Well, what did you think about him as a person? What impression was made on your mind of this fellow that you're dealing with here? Yeah. That at times he wasn't himself, and then at times he was like a nice guy, you know? He would come and go different times, you know, throughout the whole time. Then he would, like, sit, being quiet at times, watching a movie, wanting me to watch the movie, you know, and just doing little tanning sounds, you know? Did you observe him watching the movie and how he would react to the movie? Right, he would like to start rocking back and forth when he, you know, certain parts of the movie or whatever. You have to say, what did he say, man? He was like chanting at certain times and rocking back and forth. Right? Tell us about his chanting. What was that all about? Uh, I'm not even sure, sir, but it was just like, I can't tell you the words. I couldn't understand what he was saying at that time. Can you mimic him? How it sounded? It's like a slow slur, like mm, some of that nature, some close like that, I'm not sure. Did it keep on for a period of time? Off and on throughout the ordeal. And how about the, the movement back and forth? How, how was that being effectuated? Uh, just like back and forth, he would do it every now and then. You know? Just as you are rocking in right, your chair. Like this. And chanting. And chanting. Was there any parts of the movie that was going on that you saw that he said anything about? It was like the part about the preacher that used to be a preacher that had got possessed. 
that uh that uh it would seem like he was like interested in that part that part had his attention more than anything yeah. but tell us about what you mean by that what impressions were made upon your mind when this was going on as to had his attention how would he how did he appear to you it appear like like it was like he wanted to mimic it or be like that part you know being demonized or whatever in that nature I'm, I'm sorry I missed yeah you. like he wanted that that type of movie that part certain parts of that part interested him you know it was like he changed with it at times then he would get more aggressive try to get me to handcuff myself both hands he's told me it made him feel more dominant okay did you and he move off of the bed at any time he told me to lay down face down put both of my hands behind my back because he got he changed again at that point like he got more aggressive at that time okay now but tell us tell us uh did he still have the knife out yes he still had the knife out. and what did you do okay i kind of like laid on my sides for some reason i guess god told me not to lay flat down or let this person handcuff me so i didn't so you were trying to stop that from happening but you right. got down on the floor right what did he do he kind of laid across me put his head across my chest at that point what was he doing with his head pardon me what did it appear to you he was doing with his head what was he trying to do? Like he was listening to my heart, because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. He said he was going to eat your heart? Yes, that's correct. So I suggested we sit on a couch. I had unbutton my shirt to try to make him feel more at ease. And then, and then I just sat on the couch like, and he just start going out of himself again. Yeah. Going out of himself? Yeah, he was like paying me no attention at that time. Like yeah. he wasn't there? He was, yeah, he started the chanting again, and it's like the sitting there, you know. And then I just, for some reason, I said, well, I need to go to the bathroom again, and he didn't follow me at that point. So I reached up, I got up, and then I got hit him, and I ran out. So you hit him? Right. Did you have any other belongings there? Yeah, I have my bag right there at the end of the couch. I sit in exactly the same place I sit when I went in there. So when you got up, he let go of your cuff to let you go to the bathroom again? Uh, he didn't even, he just like, just let me stay there. I was going to go for the window. At that point, he didn't even have the cuff. It's like I wasn't even there anymore. And when you saw that, what would you do? Mm -hmm. I just seized the opportunity. I said, well, at least I'm going to die trying. I'm not just going to sit here, you know. What would you do, son? Uh, I hit him, and I ran towards the door, and he, like, was right there, tried to grab me, get me back in there. And what happened? Then I made it outside. So he wasn't able to bring you back bring in? Bring me back in there, no. He tried? He tried. And as you left that apartment, as you got away from him, I'm going to ask you again, mm -hmm. what impressions were made on your mind by the conduct of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the actions of Jeffrey Dahmer, by the manner, expressions, and conversations of Jeffrey Dahmer that you observed? Can you give us some words? It's like I told the policeman that this freak, this crazy guy, was trying to hurt me. Yeah. Did you run out of the building? Yes, I did. Did you summon help? Yes. Milwaukee Police Department? That's correct. Did they come back there with you to the apartment? Right. Did you eventually go back into the apartment with the Milwaukee police officers? Yes. And then he was arrested? Right. Dr. Dietz explained the compulsions of Jeffrey Dahmer. The favorite activities he describes are what he often refers to as light sex, kissing, touching, rubbing, hugging, the kinds of activities that between consenting adults would often amount to foreplay are things that he has emphasized uh, with victims and with other partners those were activities, and, and those are normal activities with a consenting adult, that give him pleasure and that he always enjoyed. But he describes difficulty in getting partners to restrict themselves to just that, because the partners that he found most often wanted to do more than that. And one of the things more than that that some of them wanted to do was to have anal sex with him which he did not like, having had a few painful experiences, he did not want to be in that position. Also, 
the partners that he was able to find universally had a deadline when they had to leave. And he was unable to spend as much time as he wanted doing these more gentle, ordinary activities with them. And so he devoted a considerable amount of his energy to finding a way to be able to have someone, or if not someone, something, that could serve that role for him as being the person or body or part with whom he could have such gentle activities as rubbing and touching and hugging and masturbation and kissing and fondling. And it's in the course of trying to find a way to keep a person for that that he engages in most of the more extreme behaviors surrounding the killings for which he's charged. If I understood what Mr. Dahmer told me correctly, and we spent a lot of time on this during, during my examination, his preference, his first choice, would have been always to be able to have a living, breathing, consenting partner who permitted him to engage in all of these light sex, to use his term, activities that were his favorite. And in fact, he said to me that had any of the victims agreed to stay with him for several weeks, then he would not have killed them if they'd agreed to stay and, and do these things. And in, there were a few whom he found particularly appealing because the physique was so close to his ideal that uh, had he been able to have a continuing relationship with those men, he felt he would have had no need for any of the rest of what he did, no particular desire to do it. So if he couldn't have them in that way, as a consenting, continuing partner, the second best way would be to have them in some other state in which they would remain with him and still be available for these activities. And the second choice that would be best for him, he thought, would have been if he could have had one of them whose will had been destroyed. And the two techniques he actually tried were, uh, of course, drilling into the uh, skull and injecting acid into the, well, what he thought would be the frontal lobe region, and likewise drilling into the skull and injecting boiling water into the frontal lobe region. And Mr. Dahmer is not the first serial killer to wish to create sex slaves and to take steps to try to create such persons who would be available for his sexual use. His third choice, and one that he often uh, got, really, was an unconscious partner. Because someone who is unconscious but alive allows him to do all of those things that he likes to do. His next choice after that was that if he could find one man with sufficiently attractive physique to keep permanently while dead, that would be useful because he could do many of the things he wanted, though not quite all. And here what he considered was something he heard about on a TV show. Uh, when we discussed it, we both thought we might have seen it on 60 Minutes, but uh, neither he nor I am sure of the particular show. But w one show did something on people who freeze-dried their pets. And Mr. Dahmer's idea was that if he could get the apparatus for that and freeze-dry a man of the appropriate physique, he'd at least be able to continue to have him to look at while masturbating, to pose perhaps in various positions if they were flexible enough in that state, to fondle, to rub, to hug, to touch. They would not have sounds to listen to, 
but they would have a lot of what he was interested in. And he thought that if he'd been able to freeze dry one of the more attractive men, that he would not have had a desire for the other victims. The step he took was to go to the library and in a magazine he thought was called Taxidermy, he found an advertisement from a supplier of the equipment for freeze drying animals and found that there were two sizes of the machines, one of which seemed like it might be large enough for humans, but the cost was prohibitive. It cost $30,000 or so, he thought, and so that was not an available option. The next best choice was that of a fresh corpse. Now, the fresh corpse, like the freeze-dried person, has the problem of not having any sounds to listen to, but it has the additional problem that it will not stay fresh. Lastly, uh, along this spectrum of people or bodies or parts under his control was the other uses he made of those whom he in fact had killed. And here he told me that he made use of the viscera for masturbation by opening the victims in the course of dismembering them. And there was a particular phase of, the, of dismemberment where he would stop sometimes to take photographs, sometimes to masturbate, sometimes both. And that was upon opening the abdomen when the abdominal viscera are first exposed. And he would masturbate while looking at that. And that was a long-standing image as far as I could determine. That was an interest he had had since late, uh, late in high school. And this gave him occasion to make use of that particular image and that's basically the spectrum of controlling another person. Now to call all of that just necrophilia really sort of misses the mark but it's it's the best word we have at the moment for it. And if Jeff Dahmer seemed normal enough on the surface, the court-appointed psychiatrist Dr. George Palermo explained why. All of us, all of us so-called normal, let's say, have features of dependency. We have uh, uh, sadistic features at times when we are not too nice to, towards people that we do, uh, let's, uh, we are with, we like, uh, and so on. We have also fetishistic features because when uh, someone of our dear ones dies, what do we do? Certainly we don't have a, a sexual fetishism, but uh, we, we, we try to embrace even the dead body because of the importance we give to this dead body, this person who was dear to us and, and, and died. Uh, and that goes along with, uh, with the uh, borderline personality. Borderline personality uh, changes mood uh, uh, from depression to elation. We all have these kind of things, not to that degree though. We, all, we are a composite of many facets and uh, we become sick when uh, these facets become exaggerated. And that is what is called personality disorder. The jury had to decide whether he was sane or insane. So it was to be prison after all, not the softer option of a secure hospital. The jury's decision was read out 15 times, once for each count. Again, in the state of Wisconsin versus Jeffrey Dahmer, case number F912542. Uh, in a special verdict, question number one. At the time the crime was committed in count two of the information, in regard to the death of Richard Guerrero, did the defendant Jeffrey L. Dahmer have a mental disease? Answer, no. The spectators now included high school parties, organized to remind youngsters of the perils of going with strangers for fun or for money. And that this was no ordinary trial was emphasized by allowing the relatives of the victims to address the court and, at last, to confront 
Jeffrey Dahmer. My name is Shirley Hughes, and I'm Tony Anthony Hughes' mother. First of all, thank God, and to give thanks to the judge and to Mr. McCann for the verdict that came in. I would like to say to Jeffrey Dahmer that he don't know the pain, the hurt, the loss, and the mental state that he had put our family in. But I'd just like to read a poem that a good friend of my son wrote. Tony thought you was his friend. He knew you. Why am I a victim in your cruel and rueful world, although I can't communicate with a loud voice? Listen to me anyway. Try to have mercy on my moans. Look at the tears roll down my face. See that each one is a cry for help. And rely, realize my sign are showing you that I want to live. Tell me just what is it that I've done to you to make you such a monster, to make you such a maniac, to make you such a devil. My God, who are you? What are you? You have never shown me this side of you. I put my trust in you. I thought you were my friend until the end, yet I didn't know you as well as I thought. I never felt the end would be this way. Is there anyone that can help me, mom, dad, sister, brother, someone, please help me? What ha what's happening to me? Everything seemed to be slowing down. I'm confused. I'm drowsy. My coordination has been contaminated. My friend, what is it that you have given me? What is it that you're doing to me? I'm helpless. Is that a thrill to you to know that I can't fight you back? And that the hardest struggle in my life is fighting to keep my eyes open with the hope of seeing the dawn of a new day. Yet you have total control over me. My life is in the hands of once a friend, but now a total stranger who have, who have become my worst nightmare. But one day, I know you'll get caught. You think you're smooth at what you're doing. Remember, whatever's done in the dark, it will come to the light, and the whole world will know just how ugly a person you really are. Mom, I'm gone. My hope, my breath, my want to live have been taken away from me unwillingly and emotionally. I know that you're, there's a dragon piercing your heart day and night because of this, but yet I'm not far away. When you get cold, I wrap my arms around you to warm you. If you get sad, I'll softly grab your heart and cheer you up. Two fingers and one thumb means I love you in sign language. My son was deaf. When you cry, take one teardrop and place it outside your window ledge. And when I pass by, I'll exchange it for one of mine. Two fingers and one thumb, Mom. My name is Dorothy Strader. I'm Curtis Strader's mother. Um, I don't have nothing prepared to say. It's just a few things that I would like to say. You took my 17-year-old son away from me. I'll never get a chance tell him that I loved him. I'd have a chance to tell him that I love him the last time I saw him, which will be a year tomorrow. You took my daughter's only brother away from her. She'll never have a chance to sing and dance with him again. You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her, and for that I can never forgive you. I'm a J.W. Smith, uh, brother of Edward Warren Smith. Edward Warren Smith tried to be Jeffrey Dahmer's friend. As a result, he lost his life. Mr. Dahmer, Eddie's gone now, the victim of your senseless killing. Where do we go from here? We ask ourselves. Why did this happen to a person like Eddie? He gave so much and asked so little. All he wanted was a chance to be himself. A chance to be happy. When all the facts are known, we hope that society will have gained some knowledge that will help prevent a tragedy such as the one Eddie suffered. There was no sacrifice too large or too small for Eddie. He truly loved giving and gave of himself abundantly. My name is Inez Thomas, and I'm the mother of David Thomas. You know, I don't understand how a person could really harm a person and to say that, well, I did this because he wasn't my type. Well, if everybody go around doing something to somebody because it's their, their type, this would be a sad world today. And I just feel that this man should never be able to walk the face of earth or to be able to harm anyone else again. Good morning, Honor. My name is Donald Bradoff. On the, for the Bradoff family, 
as much as love in our family closed. My mother gave five beautiful kids. We lost, he destroyed the baby of the family. And I hope you go to hell. I love this world. You guys did a wonderful job. Bottom of my heart, thank to God, I'm, I got a lot of strength. Thank you all. God bless America. My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jer whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, motherfucker. The court will impose a mandatory life sentence plus an additional 10 years on the habitual criminality. Count two, life imprisonment plus 10 years consecutive to count one. Count three, life imprisonment with the date of parole eligibility 70 years from the inception of that particular sentence. I don't have all the numbers that I can't work it out, but it'll be 70 years from the beginning of that sentence, which will be consecutive uh, to c count two, count four, life imprisonment with a parole eligibility to be 70 years from the commencement. Count 15, uh, life imprisonment with parole eligibility to be 70 years after the inception of that sentence to be consecutive to count 14. I, I have, believe I have and I intended to follow the recommendation of the state. I, I could have said something different which would have had the same impact I really see nobody gains anything by just to say more and more years. The important point is that the sentence is structured in such a way that this defendant will never again see freedom. Your Honor, it is over now. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I want a death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. The doctors have told me about my sickness and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I decided to go through this trial for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was to let the world know that these were not hate crimes. I wanted the world in Milwaukee, which I deeply hurt, to know the truth of what I did. I didn't want unanswered questions. All the questions have now been answered. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. But most of all, Mr. Boyle and I decided that maybe there was a way for us to tell the world that if there are people out there with these disorders, maybe they can get some help before they end up being hurt or hurting someone. I think the trial did that. <laughs>